Good morning and welcome to this session of Business Breeders, a live webinar series hosted by Goodman Group here at Brock University. My name is Abdul Wahimi and it's my pleasure to serve as the director of Goodman Group at the Goodman School of Business. Goodman Group, as many of you would know, is a community-focused learning and development services provider that works to support professionals, businesses, and entrepreneurs pursuing growth through accredited professional development certificates, programs, executive education, consulting services, and startup support. It's my pleasure to welcome all you all from many parts of the country by taking your break with us, uh, by taking part in this webinar. This webinar series aims to provide 45-minute breeders filled with insightful discussions on timely topics that are relevant to businesses and everyday lives, led by our award-winning Brock University faculty and leading industry experts, encouraging thoughtful debates and keeping us all feeling connected as we all get through this. This webinar series is hosted on Wednesdays from 11 to 11.45. In a moment, I'll hand the screen over to today's webinar lead and that's Jacqueline, Jacqueline King, who will lead today's discussion. Uh, Jacqueline will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll spend some time answering your questions towards the, the back end. Uh, so uh, we will likely start off by answering your questions that came through at the point of at, at the time of registration, but also we will answer many of your questions uh, that will come through the live, uh, uh, live during this session. Uh, so by all means, Put your questions in the chat feature, which is open now. You may also uh, uh, tweet your questions, and that would be at GSB Goodman Group, all one word. So that's at GSB Goodman Group, where you can tweet your uh, comments, feedback, and also your questions, which, could, which, which will be answered live as we go through. At the end, I'll provide some information on how you can get uh, access uh, uh, in terms of today's material and webinar recording. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's webinar lead, and that's Jacqueline King, who is a CPA turned learning and development consultant. Quite a mix, Jacqueline, with <laughs> 20 years of experience, which has spanned multiple industries, both in Canada and overseas. Success in her accounting career came from the ability to form great relationships and helping people from all levels of the organization to understand the numbers and, of course, and very importantly, the, their impact. She often heard, you're not a typical accountant. I think I would definitely agree with that, Jacqueline. <laughs> Which sparked a desire to find out what differentiates truly effective finance and accounting professionals from the pack. It boiled down to one thing, and that's communication, which is the topic of today. Her desire to focus more specifically in this room, in particular, helping professionals and teams to develop uh, the, the communication skills needed to reach beyond their technical expertise and realize their full potential, of course. And that is that has been quite a journey. And in that pattern of journey, we're here and uh, grateful for uh, Jacqueline King having found some time to speak to us. Welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm just going to share my screen and make sure that we have what we need. And we do. All right. Well, thank you so much, Abdul, for having me. And a big thanks to everyone who's registered and is here watching. I'm really, really excited to be here today. Effective communication is something that I'm really passionate about, and so I'm certainly hoping that you'll be able to take something tangible away from today's webinar that you can put into practice right away. Today, I'm going to start by telling you a quick story about how I came to be interested in this subject matter. So like Abdul said, I'm an accountant by origin, and so People don't see it as a clear path, and I know I didn't either, from being a CPA to becoming someone who is really passionate about effective communication. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about that. And we're going to look at two simple questions that you can use to try and gauge the communication style of your stakeholder. And then we're going to use that information to look at some simple strategies that you'll be able to use to tailor your communication. 
So without further ado, we'll just step right into it. So like I said, I want to tell you a quick story about what really started me down this path. I was working overseas. I was working at a university in the Middle East as the director of finance and our organization was funded entirely by the state. So we needed to present our budget to the deputy minister of finance for approval. And it was my first year and I was prepared. I knew every number inside out and backward. I had a three inch indexed binder with every calculation that we had done to get to this budget amount. I was ready to go. So we go to the meeting and it was in this over the top glass and marble filled building, very grand, very impressive. We were escorted to the boardroom and there was a long marble boardroom table that sat about 20. Uh, there's a lot of marble in the Middle East, <laughs> it's everywhere. So the deputy minister sat at the head of the table and he had eight or 10 people from his department on one side of the table, as well as another eight or 10 sitting behind them in a row of chairs. And my boss and I sat in our two, two lone chairs on our side of the table. And so there was some cursory introductions. And then I began to lay out our budget request. And right at the beginning, the deputy minister cut me off and he said, we are cutting your operating budget by 25%. So I was surprised, I was taken aback, <laughs> but I countered with some information about how we'd gotten to our budget request. I knew I had this in the bag. I hadn't just ballparked this number. All of these calculations were driven meticulously by anticipated student numbers. And this wasn't an inflated request. I was happy to explain it. I had that three inch binder ready to go. And he waved me off and he said, we've given you money in the past and you don't spend it. And we could have been using that money for other things. So no, we're cutting your budget by 25%. Now I was starting to get flustered. I realized the devastating impact that a 25% budget cut would have on our operations. We'd have to reduce student intake. We'd have to lay off employees. So I started in again. I, I don't think you understand where these numbers are coming from. In prior years, they didn't spend the money. But I have a very detailed plan that outlines how we're going to spend it. If you would just look at the detailed package that I sent over and I started to open my binder and he actually stood up and leaned over the table and yelled at me. I've been given the power to decide how much money you get and I'm cutting your budget by 25%. Then he turned around and he left the room and that was the end of the meeting. Over the next few months, I was left to try and clean up the aftermath of our budget massacre. For those of you who are wondering, yes, that is an actual photo taken of me during that time period. It was, <laughs> it was a rough couple of months. I replayed that meeting over and over and over again, and I tried to figure out where I'd gone wrong. And I concluded that the issue must be cross-cultural communication. I needed to learn how to effectively communicate within my new cultural environment. So I spent a lot of time studying different cultures and how I could be more effective. And slowly I was able to make changes to my approach that helped me from reliving that first year horror. <laughs> I was able to adopt different strategies and be more effective, but something really interesting began to happen. The more that I learned about cross-cultural communication and the longer that I was overseas, and I was overseas for about seven and a half years, the more that I realized that it wasn't just a cultural divide. That people within the same cultures also had different communication styles and preferences. And so it wasn't just a one size fits all type of scenario. And so when I got back to Canada, it wasn't, oh, well, we all communicate like Canadians here, so this is so easy. It was actually very similar an idea to the experience overseas, but here at home, the differences weren't driven by differences in culture. It was differences in communication style and preferences. So I began to learn about these differences and I studied personality and communication assessment tools like Myers-Briggs, I'm sure a lot of you have done that one, Finder, and then my preferred tool, which is Everything Disc. 
So what all of these tools have in common, they all have different ways of looking at things, but what they all have in common is that they categorize behaviors and preferences into a specific communication type. And so then that is something that you can use to start to make sense of, you know, who we are and how we communicate compared to others and what impact that has. So no matter what the tool, they really all boil down to one fundamental truth. And that is, well, when we were kids, we learned the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated. But in the real world, that's actually really bad advice. Just because you like to receive information in a specific way does not mean that that's how everyone else wants to receive it. You need to think about your stakeholders and how they prefer to receive and process information. So let's think back to my issue with the Deputy Minister of Finance. If I had to give that presentation again today, but that deputy minister was actually one of these four people, how would it need to change? So same data, same analysis, same recommendations, same budget request. But when you think about these four people, you can imagine that my approach would need to be very different. Whenever possible, you want to be able to tailor your approach to the individual communication style of your stakeholders. So where would we need to begin to start with that? Understanding and tailoring communication styles is one of my very favorite things in the world to talk about and I facilitate half day and full day workshops just on this one specific topic that we're about to discuss. But like I said, I really want you to walk away with something tangible from this 30 minute webinar. So I'm pulling these two questions that you can use to start this process of understanding your stakeholders communication styles. The first question is, is your stakeholder fast paced and outspoken or cautious and reflective? So are they active and assertive and dynamic and bold? And if so, then they're probably more fast paced and outspoken. Or would you describe them more as moderate paced and calm and methodical and thoughtful? And in that case, they're more likely cautious and reflective. So that's question one, is your stakeholder fast paced and outspoken or cautious and reflective? In question two, you think about the stakeholder in terms of, are they questioning and skeptical or are they accepting and warm? So are they logic focused, objective, reserved and challenging? And by challenging, I don't mean challenging to deal with, although they could be, <laughs> they could definitely could be, but I mean, do they challenge what you say? So if so, they're likely questioning and skeptical. Or are they more people focused? So are they empathizing and receptive and just generally agreeable? So if so, then they're more likely accepting and warm. So once you've answered, there are these two questions, there are four possible results. Your stakeholder could be fast paced and outspoken and questioning and skeptical, or fast paced and outspoken and accepting and warm or accepting and warm and cautious and reflective. Or finally, they could be cautious and reflective and questioning and skeptical. So these two questions actually come from the everything DISC model that I mentioned a couple slides ago. So in the world of DISC, these four possible outcomes correspond with the four main communication styles of their assessment. So D, I, S, and C. We only have 30 minutes, so I'm not gonna get into a bunch of detail about DISC. I just wanted to mention that that's where this model is based, but we're really just gonna focus on these two questions and then look at some strategies for being more effective. So let's start with fast-paced and outspoken and questioning and skeptical. So that person may be described as log logic, they focus on objectives, re they're reserved, they may be challenging, and they also may be active and assertive and dynamic and bold. Now, 
all of those adjectives won't necessarily apply, but it starts to give you a good sense, like a paint a picture of what that stakeholder might look like. I think it's easier to conceptualize these traits if we're thinking about someone in particular. So I'm gonna go back to some of those photos I showed you, and we're gonna look at some pop cultural references that we can use as we walk through this process. So Princess Leia from Star Wars, I think fits the bell of fast paced and outspoken and questioning and skeptical. She was assertive and dynamic and outspoken and she used logic and she challenged everyone. She wasn't afraid to tell it like it was and take charge. Dwight Schrute is another good example from The Office. He was also assertive and not afraid to take charge. He was very fact driven and challenging. He was definite and decisive and direct. And of course, the mother of dragons, Daenerys Targaryen from Game of Thrones. She was dynamic and bold and outspoken. She was objective and logical up until that last season. For those of you that watched it, she did a bit of a 180 that I can't account for. But for the first number of seasons, she was very objective and logical. She was a definite leader. So let's take a look at some strategies to tailor your communication style to a stakeholder like this. This group is fast paced and action oriented, so you want to minimize small talk and get to the point. Keep your messaging high level because a deep dive into the details will make them lose interest in a real hurry. Don't use emotionally based arguments. You need to stick to facts and make your point. If possible, come ready with some solutions or options to evaluate. And Show confidence. If you really want to be heard, you're going to need to speak up and sometimes defend your position. With this group of stakeholders, your silence may just be interpreted as your agreement with whatever they're saying. So in retrospect, I think that the Deputy Minister of Finance who cut my budget by 25% fell into this group. So I'm not sure if I had been more successful, if I'd have used some of these tactics, but I definitely know that my binder full of calculations and insistence that he would just understand if only he examined the process that I'd used didn't go over well. That wasn't the way I needed to shape my messaging for him. Next, we're gonna look at fast paced and outspoken, but this time paired with accepting and warm. So this person may be described as active, assertive, dynamic, and bold, but unlike the last group, they may also be described as people-focused, receptive, agreeable, and empathetic. I think Michael Scott from The Office is firmly within <laughs> this quadrant. He uh, is dynamic and bold and active and outspoken. But unlike the other group, he's more focused on people and relationships, and he tends to use emotion rather than logic for decision making. So he's full of enthusiasm and ideas, and he's a hell of a salesman. Bill Dumpy from Modern Family is fast paced, never into the details. He thrives on people and relationships. He's a perennial optimist, he oozes charisma, He's everybody's favorite dad who doesn't love Phil. Dolly Parton speaks her mind. She's very dynamic. She's also very empathetic and agreeable and cheerful and charming and engaging. So let's look at some strategies that you might use for this stakeholder group. Be open and listen to their ideas. This group is generally pretty creative. They want to be part of the conversation. There is nothing that will frustrate them faster than having their ideas shut down right off the bat without even being considered. Keep the details to a minimum. They want to focus on the big picture, not the minutia. It's easier to get buy-in from this group if they feel enthusiastic about what you have to say. So you have to try and generate some enthusiasm around your ideas. Share personal stories and anecdotes when speaking about an idea. 
this will help someone with this group feel connected to you and the more connected to you they're going to feel more trust and they're going to be more receptive to what you have to say and here the outcomes are far more important than the process that you used to get to your outcomes so you want to focus on why they should care about what you have to say rather than all of the detail about how you got there Next, we'll look at accepting and warm and cautious and reflective. So this person may be described as people-focused, receptive, agreeable, and empathetic, but this time paired with moderate-paced, calm, methodical, and thoughtful. Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, uh, I think, is accepting and warm and cautious and reflective. He cares about people. He's empathetic. He's also moderate-paced and calm. He likes to keep the peace. And he's an all-around great neighbor. Princess Diana, the people's princess, she devoted a lot of her time and life to helping people. She was quiet and reserved by nature, but she used her station to bring impact to underserved people whenever possible. Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. I, I like this example because sometimes when you think about accepting and warm and cautious and reflective, it can paint a bit of a stereotypical picture of someone who's really meek and, and kind of weak. But Jon Snow, He's a total badass, but he fits this bill. He's cautious and he's humble and he really cares about everyone's feelings and he's ensuring that everyone gets heard and gets what they need. And he also fights zombies, which is pretty awesome. So let's look at some strategies to tailor your approach to this group of stakeholders. Avoid introducing change at the last minute. This group needs some processing time to feel comfortable with any kind of change that you're going to introduce. Create an environment where they don't need to fight to get their ideas heard. This group definitely has opinions and preferences, but they're less likely to offer them unless they're explicitly given space and time to do so. And building on the last point, Silence doesn't necessarily mean agreement. If you're someone who's really fast paced and you swing into a meeting with a new idea and you say, hey, any questions? Great, let's move forward. Then you may have some unwelcome surprises down the line when you find you don't actually have buy-in from these stakeholders. It's just they weren't really given the opportunity to think through it or respond in a way that they felt comfortable. So it's not that this group doesn't appreciate facts and logic, but it's also important to include an emotional impact and feelings as well, because this is gonna be a big concern. And further to that, let them know that you've considered the impact to others. Anytime that you're making plans or making decisions, then how that's gonna impact your colleagues and coworkers and the people within an organization is going to be really important people matter as much as profits to this stakeholder group. So finally, let's take a look at cautious and reflective paired with questioning and skeptical. So this person might be described as moderate paced, calm, methodical, and thoughtful, but also logic focused, objective, reserved, and challenging. Spock from Star Trek is a great example. So Spock could not comprehend making a decision based on emotion. And in fact, sometimes he would use a single word to voice his disagreement. Illogical. Like that was it. If he said illogical, as far as he was concerned, that was the end of the discussion. In my ideal dream world, I also only need to mutter illogical for a conversation to stop. But it hasn't worked for me so far. <laughs> so Spock was reserved and objective, and he took a lot of time to weigh all the angles of a situation. 
Ross Geller from Friends is another interesting example. He was extremely detailed and fact focused, and he was also very methodical and more measured in approach than the rest of the people in his group of friends. C-3PO from Star Wars was extremely cautious and looked at all sides of an issue. He spoke only in facts and truth, and he would challenge anyone who did anything to the contrary. So let's look at some strategies to tailor your communication to this group. So these stakeholders will want to know about the how just as much as the what. They need to see that you followed a logical path to get to your conclusions in order to have any trust in those conclusions. So come with facts to support your opinions. Having a feeling about something will not be perceived as a valid reason for this stakeholder group. It's important not to appear biased. So you can build credibility by demonstrating that you've looked at all sides of the issue. You're gonna be hard pressed to get immediate buy-in for big changes. This group is going to need time to analyze and process your information. And so you need to plan for that. So something that may help is to provide information ahead of a meeting or discussion that's going to allow them for some time to process and then focus on the areas where they're really going to need more information from you. So you might be thinking at this stage of the presentation, I don't think people are that simple. How can two questions be enough to understand someone? And the answer is they can't. So people, people are incredibly complex. And as I mentioned, these two questions are based on the Everything Disk assessment tool. And even Everything Disk actually identifies 12 different communication styles. And then there's even room for outlying attributes and preferences that, that muddy the water. So you don't you can't know everything that there is to know about someone's communication style and preferences based on these two questions. But they do provide a starting point for you to craft your messaging. We know that what works for Spock isn't going to be very effective for Michael Scott. And what works for Princess Leia is probably not ideal for Ned Flanders. So these two simple questions can just help get you thinking about your stakeholders and what their communication preferences might be. As we were walking through those communication styles and strategies, I would bet that you were able to relate to one, possibly two of them as your own style. And you maybe even had a little bit of an adverse reaction as we walked through some of the strategies for communicating with some of the other styles a bit of an eye roll, they're thinking, oh, why would I have to do that? But you need to bear in mind that we all have a tendency to view our own communication style as the best. I know I have lamented on plenty of occasions that the world would be a better place if everyone just thought and communicated like I do. But the fact is that no one's style is better than the other. And each of these styles has strengths and has weaknesses, and they actually all balance each other out. People who are slower paced and analytical make sure we don't rush headlong into bad decisions, while people who are faster paced and willing to take chances ensure that we don't get stuck in a rut. People who are logical and challenging ensure that we use facts and data to make good decisions, while those who are people-focused ensure that we bring humanity and empathy into our decision-making processes and that we're not just robots. So don't spend too much time wishing that someone was different. And instead, if you can, try and see what they bring to the table instead, even, even when they drive you crazy. So I've given you a really high level overview of tailoring your communication style. And the things that I'd really like you to take away today are 
just because you like to receive and process information in a specific way does not mean everyone else feels the same way. Your communication style is not the best communication style. Every style brings something different and valuable to the conversation. And using those two questions and strategies, you can make small changes that have big, big impact. So I want you to go forth and use your new skills and wow your stakeholders. But before we do that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Abdul for the Q&A. Jackie, thank you very much for that. Very, very insightful. Those two questions, they may seem simple, but they're, 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 they're quite loaded, if I might say that. Uh, there's a lot that you uncover and unpacked in there, so they're wonderful. Uh, right, so I look to my other screen for questions that have come through. Uh, let me see if I get to the right one here. Uh, can you explain further which criteria you use to uh, oh, let me see. Can you explain further which criteria you use to group countries together? To group the cow oh, from a cultural perspective. From, from a cultural perspective. Well, I mean, what was interesting about when I lived in the Middle East was that it's a big mishmash of cultures. Like there's, because there's so many people from different countries moving into some of those Gulf nations, then it wasn't mm -hmm. just about learning one specific culture. So it's right. not like, oh, I'm moving to Japan for two years and I'm gonna study the Japanese culture. Instead it was, yeah. oh, okay, so I was in Qatar and I'm working with people from Qatar and I'm also working from people with other Middle Eastern backgrounds, Jordan and Egypt and Syria and Oman. And then you have all of the Europeans who are there and all of their cultures are so different. And then the Philippines and India and Sri Lanka and Nepal and so, it wasn't something where I suddenly had to become an expert in every single culture, because I think it would have been impossible. But there were generalities that you had to apply based on things like, is the culture low context or high context? So that means, do they just say what they mean? Or is there a lot of reading in between the lines that's required, where it would be considered rude to just say what you mean? And I think that that was probably the the biggest factor in terms of deciding how to communicate was trying to generally lump cultures into those two boxes of high context and low context. So mm -hmm. if I'm talking with an American, I'm very likely, or a, you know, a German or, or someone from Switzerland, I'm just going to tell, tell it like it is. I'm just going to say what's on my mind. Right. Whereas if I'm dealing with someone from Saudi or Qatar, it's it's much more layered than that and more nuanced. And so mm -hmm. it, it would be very rare that you would just offer a challenging position, which is very likely why I had such difficulty with <laughs> with the deputy minister of finance as I as I challenged his authority in front of the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. And uh, that 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 nuances that uh, that, that, that there are amongst the different cultures and how that communication piece takes place. Okay. Uh, let me scroll to the next one. How do you determine styles before and or during communication situation? So that's a tricky one. Obviously, if you've never met mm. someone, then you just kind of have to stay general and right. feel it out as you go. So some of the key factors will be how does someone walk into the meeting and start the meeting? So do they jump right in and they're talking and they're giving you their opinion and they've got all of their ideas? Well, then it's very likely that they're in that fast paced, you know, assertive uh, versus are they just kind of hanging back in the meeting and listening to what you have to say? And if you're someone who's fast paced and assertive, do you suddenly realize five minutes into the meeting that you've been talking for five straight minutes and nobody has said anything else? And then you realize, okay, I need to be able to take a step back here and really, you know, try and invite some others into the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I guess listen uh, with more than just words and, and ears and, and with <laughs> your eyes and be prepared to adapt quickly Definitely. Uh, to your audience. I mean, it's, cer but it's certainly easier when it's stakeholders you know, you're dealing with your boss, you're dealing with people in the office that you deal that, you know, on a regular basis. But yeah, the adaptive piece when you're, when you're with new groups of people is pretty important. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're presenting to a group of people, which style should you choose? 
So that's an interesting one that I get asked a lot, actually. Yeah. So again, depends on the context. So yeah. for something like this, for instance, I really have no idea the communication style of my audience. So I just did my best yeah. in terms of William, what level of detail is going to keep people interested and engaged and, and enough that I can get the point across of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're giving a presentation to a group at work, you might have specific stakeholders who are going to have a bigger impact. So it might be your boss or who's the key decision maker in the group, or maybe you're talking to a client. And so while you want it to stay broad enough that you can try and keep everybody engaged, you might want to zero in to those very specific stakeholders that are going to have the biggest impact on you being successful with whatever it is that you're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Good, good points in there. Uh, is there a, a particular style of communication that is more popular amongst the group and more people that you tend to see fall into it than other communication styles, for example? Well, what's interesting is that obviously the norm, if you think about work meetings or different mm -hmm. types of scenarios, it's usually those people in the, that again, fast-paced, assertive, outspoken group that tend to take up most of the airtime in meetings. And so I wouldn't say that that means that those communication styles are more popular. I would say people are likely fairly split between the two. Um, it's just that by the nature of them, they sort of tend to take over. And so it really becomes twofold if you are one of those people being able to recognize that and be able to make room mm -hmm. for other people and their ideas but on the same side if you are one of those people that likes to hang back and isn't really comfortable just asserting yourself and putting yourself out there realizing that you may need to make some of those stretches if you want to be effective and uh, because you can't count on you know your other peers or coworkers to invite you into the conversation and so if you want to mm -hmm. have a bigger impact Work, you need to be able, willing and able to, to stretch into areas that might not be as comfortable. Yeah, there was some recent research that I came across something about correlation, not necessarily causation, of course, correlation between how I've spoken you maybe in a, during meetings and your uh, uh, progression trajectories and opportunities in an organization, which was, which was interesting. And I think and that's fair. That, yeah. I, I think that's fair because it's almost like, you know, squeaky wheel gets the oil often. So, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. That, that, yeah. Okay. Here's the other one. Uh, how is it best to communicate uh, your preferred style to your team or direct reports? So if it's your team and your direct reports, what, what I've always done is basically said to my team, listen, I want you to give me your opinion. My preference is that if I'm doing something wrong, I'm saying something wrong, mm -hmm. I want you to step in. I want you to feel free to say, to speak, speak your mind and, and sort of lay it out there in terms of what my preference is. But at the same time, that doesn't absolve you of, uh, you know, trying to tailor to your actual employees. So it's one thing for me to say to a group of introverted employees, listen, I really like you to speak your mind and I'm going to speak my mind. And so now, and then expel, okay, great. That's good. I gave them permission to speak their mind. And so that's the end of it because it doesn't work that way. People suddenly don't right. want to give you their opinion when it's not what they're used to. So it was about letting them know the way I prefer, but then still working actively to try and tailor my communication style one-on-one -on -one with them. I suppose it goes back to your uh, golden rule that you spoke about earlier. So if you want to receive it in the way that you like to receive, then you're only going to find certain or smaller number of people, but I suppose yeah. it's more about how they like to communicate. So I, just I, I think that one of the biggest pieces of learning I ever had around that was probably around five or six years ago, I was doing a, you know, a, a team building exercise with my staff and we were using, I think we were using Myers-Briggs and there was a little exercise that we were doing and, and it came out people who use logic um, and facts to make decisions versus people who use emotion, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and feelings to make decisions. And it had never dawned on me. So I was so strong, like many accountants, I was so strong toward the fact and logic driven piece that it had never dawned on me that if I could explain something 
you know, if I could explain something to someone, even if it was a bad thing, but if I could explain it logically and lay it out for them in terms of, you know, this is why, here's the logical reason why we're going to do this thing you don't like. I, it, it was beyond me that everyone wouldn't be able to just accept that and move on. <laughs> so <laughs> I was embarrassed by how late into my career I was before I realized, like, I mean, that's not going to work. That's not going to always, you know, help people really adapt to what I want and and, and I really, really accept the, you know, emotional and, and feeling impact. So yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm a little bit of a typical accountant. <laughs> I just no, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I, I I hear what you're saying. You know, and 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 you're coming earlier about you know that 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 th those spark moments. We all have them, I guess. You know, if we're not <laughs> if we're not saying it out loud, we're probably thinking it from time to time. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, here's another one. Can people change between categories? Or is it possible that it's that it changes based on a professional environment versus personal environment? Could the same person be, um, I guess, you know, different versions of the same person, depending on the on, on the environment? I've heard it, I've heard it explained a couple of, of different ways, but the one way that I like is the best is that you don't you don't change in terms of your natural preferences, you know, we're sort of innately born with the way that we are. Right. It's what's learned is the ability to stretch yourself given the scenario or given the context. So if you're this naturally, you know, soft spoken, you know, people focused person, does it mean that you can't then be effective and speak your mind and use logic to make decisions or whatever? No, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that I, you know, can't deal with my colleagues who are going to want to use emotion and feelings to make decisions? No, it's just, a, it's a bigger stretch for me. So, so some people it's going to come really naturally because that's naturally who they are. And for others, it's a stretch, but it's something you need to work at in order to be able to get better at. Right. It doesn't Great. come all right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it just means that you're going to have to spend a little bit more time on that developing this business. Excellent. Thank you, Jackie, very much for taking time out of your busy schedule, for being here today and for presenting these wonderful ideas and strategies as well and taking the time to answer those questions as well to those who are but also for those who are watching the recording at a later time. Much appreciate you taking the time. Uh, for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of those who have joined us uh, by taking a, a break out of your busy schedules and catching your breath with us here this morning. And of course, all of those uh, that may be uh, watching this, uh, their, their recorded session later coming in. I am uh, going to talk to you about in terms of how you may get uh, access and the office, and it should be available later this week um, on our website. Uh, and of course, you may also get uh, a link to this as part of our uh, our newsletter that will be going out monthly. Uh, furthermore, uh, as you know, and you can see the slide on the screen, the uh, deadline to register for uh, the non-profit uh, leadership certificate program is approaching fast. Uh, September 22nd is the deadline when that closes. I would encourage you to uh, uh, reserve your spot now. Uh, we do have a very limited number of seats available at this uh, time. Um, and uh, we've, we've, we've had a good uh, a degree of interest with this uh, uh, program, which has been around for a number of years. And it was built with the help of uh, nonprofit uh, organizations in Niagara. Uh, and uh, we've had uh, a very, very high uh, uh, feedback in terms of those who have gone through this program. Uh, over 96% uh, or uh, over 95% uh, satisfaction rate uh, for, of, from all those who have attended this program, as well as 100% of individuals who have gone through the program have realized a raise or uh, a movement uh, upward in the, in the organization, which is which is a great position to be in. So I encourage you all to uh, register uh, 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 for those that apply, and you can do so by visiting our uh, website, and that is uh, 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 brockyu.ca as uh, Goodman Group. 
details on how to get in touch with myself or my team is also available on the subsequent slides as well. Next week, we will be uh, we'll be joined by individuals from Erie Mutual Insurance, one of our partners, uh, uh, a great local uh, insurance company here based in Niagara, who will be focusing on small business liability and staying afloat uh, amongst all the chaos. Uh, something that I'm looking forward to hearing and listening uh, from the comments uh, of the Erie Mutual and getting their expertise. And something that it, uh, would be very useful for every uh, small business uh, here in Niagara and also beyond. So that is next week, uh, September 23rd at 11 uh, to 11.45. I hope you can join us then. And until then, stay safe.